we have found that there is stupendous complexity of all living systems. This is confirmed by tiny molecular machines seen in every form of life. In today's program, we'll show that the precise specifications by which they are manufactured belong to a non-material category of reality. For that basic reason, these machines cannot be explained by any naturalistic process. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Darwinism Doesn't Work, Part 2, with Dr. John Baumgartner. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. John Baumgartner, is Research Professor Emeritus in the School of Engineering at Liberty University. He has a Ph.D. in geophysics from UCLA and worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory in computational physics during most of his scientific career. Since the early 1980s, he has provided most of the primary research on the concept of catastrophic plate tectonics, and he helped develop software modeling mutation and natural selection. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Ray. It's Pleasure. great to have you back for Darwinism Doesn't Work, Part 2. What are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking primarily about the phenomenon of language and why this is such a problem for the theory of evolution. In the previous part, we saw that life at the molecular level relies on thousands of different miniature protein machines, many with moving parts. I like this transport robot known as kinesin. Thousands of these in every cell. Uh, we, another example we looked at was uh, a machine called ATP synthase. This tiny electrical rotary machine recycles ADP and phosphate back into ATP. Uh, we saw that ATP is the little energy molecule that, that powers most of these other molecular machines. This uh, ATP synthase is assembled from 31 different proteins. Many of our cells each contain hundreds of thousands of these tiny rotary machines. And the amount of, of a, uh, ATP that gets recycled each day is approximately equal to our body weight. So it's a major process going on in our bodies at all uh, at all times. It's an amazing number of times, all the time. It's how we live, it's how we move, it's how everything functions in our body. Right. And right. we saw that, that every kind of living organism has this machine in it, from bacteria to plants, all the animals and humans. And we also, last time, saw that proteins which form these cellular machines are all manufactured by a special machine known as a ribosome. And we saw that the specifications for each protein are encoded in a string of messenger RNA copied from the DNA library. And this, uh, we, we see here, this, this uh, string here is the, uh, is the messenger RNA that, that moves through the ribosome and, and, and causes the protein uh, chain to be assembled in just the right manner. And this is where that, the instruction comes in. And right. Right. Okay. So um, and we made the strong claim that these DNA specifications are linguistic in their ultimate essence and hence non-material and therefore could never arise by any sort of process involving matter alone. It's not made from anything material. No electron, proton, neutron has no mass. It's invisible, odorless, tasteless. You know, undetectable by our senses, our, our five senses. So it's something that is entirely apart from matter. 
Prior to the mid 20th century, no one even suspected that the genetic specifications would turn out to be linguistic in nature and therefore non-material. But that all changed when the details of the DNA molecule and protein synthesis were unraveled in the 1950s and 60s. So that began the, the point where we, we had to say, wow, there's a lot going on here that isn't just uh, random processes. Something is ordering and communicating and directing. Right. Everything came into focus. Under, you know, people began to understand how all this worked, the details. With the unveiling of the structure of DNA beginning in 1953, it was discovered that what are called nucleotide base, bases, I'll say a little more about that in a moment, in the DNA serve as letters of a genetic language. And this language specifies the structural details of living organisms, astonishingly down to the level of the individual atom, the rungs in the ladder, so to speak. Uh, the, 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 these little pieces that link the two helical backbones of DNA together. And these discoveries in the 1950s and 60s reveal that the DNA specifications are indeed linguistic. They are found to have an alphabet, a vocabulary, and a grammar. The uh, DNA alphabet consists of the four letters, A, T, C, and G, the vocabulary for describing proteins consists of 64 three-letter words, and the basic grammar was quickly worked out. However, many of its subtleties are still being studied today. So th when we talk about letters and words and grammar, we're, we're talking about how scientists assign names to what they see repeated uh, throughout the DNA. Right. So this uh, little chart uh, is... Uh, what I'm calling the DNA dictionary. Uh, it it, it uh, corresponds to the amino acid meanings that are assigned to, to these 64 three-letter DNA words. Uh, sometimes those words are called codons. So in the left-hand column, you have the name of the amino acid. There are some 20 amino acids in living tissue, and then uh, the middle column are, is the one letter abbreviation for these amino acids. And then the, the right column are the DNA words or codons. Some amino acids have, uh, have many different words that all mean, all, all point to that amino acid. Others just have one. Uh, and so, and then there are also some codons that serve as punctuation to the code down at the bottom. So th this, is, uh, this is the dictionary. The discovery of the details of how DNA carries and transmits heritable genetic traits has re resulted in a huge challenge for neo-Darwinian theory. Th that challenge is how to account for coded linguistic specifications in a purely materialistic manner. Darwinism uh, has no room for anything non-material. It's, it only deals with material uh, phenomena. It sounds like they're seeing mind, but they're trying to explain it with matter. That's right, and, exactly. And, and you can't do that. That's right, that's right. So in that context, I'd like to draw the viewer's attention the fact that language in its fundamental essence is non-material. Language is very real, plays a huge role in our world today. Uh, human society, uh, especially our techno uh, technological society simply could not exist without language. For most people, this is a radically new idea uh, that, uh, that there could even could be something non-material. I remember learning that all there is in the universe is matter and energy and time, and that that accounts for everything. Right. And uh, that, that isn't the whole story, is yeah, it? We're, we're deeply indoctrinated with that outlook mm. today. And many Christians have difficulty uh, when you raise the idea that there is uh, verifiable non-material reality. So defining terms clearly is very important. So just what do I mean by the term language? I want to define that. Uh, the, the way I'm using that term agrees in most essential aspects uh, with the term formal language used, used in the fields of linguistics, computer science, and mathematics. 
In accordance with that definition, language involves first assignment of meaning to a set of otherwise arbitrary symbols to form a vocabulary. So there are meanings associated with these, with these words on the screen. And then second, the second uh, critical uh, requirement is a set of rules by which elements or words from the vocabulary can be joined together to create more complex meaning structures. So in simpler terms, language encodes meaning utilizing a set of symbols or words and a set of rules. Let's look now at what it means to assign meaning to a set of symbols. And the symbols I'm using is the, is the verbal sounds humans can make when they speak, speak a language. So there is a, a certain meaning that this, this, actually the same meaning among humans is being assigned to these different symbols or different sounds. To a certain fraction of the population of uh, our world today, that's, that uh, symbol or sound is dog. For other people on the planet, uh, the, uh, the sound is hunt. Others, for others, it's kien, people in France. Uh, sobaka is, is the sound in Russia. Cane in, in Italian. Perro in Spanish. And gao in Chinese. Okay, so we, have, we see that the symbol is arbitrary. I could, I could create a new language come up with a new sound, assign that sound the same meaning. So the sound is really an arb arbitrary, we're, we're, but the important thing is the meaning that gets assigned to it. And that's crucial to language so that we wouldn't be able to communicate the idea of, of a dog as we have the picture there on the screen unless we assign some sound that I agree with and that you agree with and now I can say that sound and since we both are abiding by the same rules you know that I mean this real thing over here a dog. Correct. Exactly. So here I've got 11 symbols, 11 words and let's look at the meaning that uh, comes forth. The guide dog led the blind girl through the city traffic. That's a fa fairly complex meaning structure, but yet I can communicate that with just these 11 words. So let's look at uh, the various kinds of language that exist. You know, we've been using human language to communicate on this show, both verbal and uh, a written form, but there's also computer language that humans have, have invented. And then there's math mathematics itself qualifies as language uh, of assigning meaning to symbols and having a set of rules to manipulate the symbols and then meaningful expressions. And then genetic language, it turns out, satisfies this definition. So gen what we're calling genetic language is true, true language according to the definition we just looked With at. With an alphabet and those three letter words right. and right. so forth. Mm -hmm. The meaning assigned to words is abstract and non-material. So meaning uh, is, is something apart from electrons and protons. We can't weigh meaning we can't, in a jar. We no, can't measure it. No, no. So therefore, language, which is, is simply encoded meaning, is also uh, non-material. And the non, another aspect of it is that non the non-materiality of language is further affirmed by the fact that the meaning a message conveys does not depend on its material carrier. You know, the, the sound that, that I, my, vo my, my vocal cords make get, gets transmitted as vibrations through the ear which your, uh, through the air which your ear uh, translates, picks up and, and sends to your brain. And, and yes, there is a material carrier involved, but the, the message, the meaning, does not depend on what material carrier. So uh, uh, we could, a message if reliably encoded and transmitted is the same, whether it is sent by, uh, by a paper and ink, on a magnetic disc, on a plastic CD, or chiseled on a rock. Hmm. The material carrier doesn't matter. 
A message, when reliably transmitted, is identical, whether it's carried by acoustic waves through the air, relayed electronically, faxed email encrypted, sent through the mail on a DVD, or carried by smoke signals. The message has an identity and a reality independent of its material carrier. Uh, to reiter reiterate, language conveys meaning, encodes meaning, expresses meaning. The essence of language is the meaning it conveys. And because meaning is non-material, so is language. So a reality that isn't composed of matter, yet we rely on it and we use it without even thinking about right. it. Right. Our thoughts involve language. You know, our interactions with other people is pr primarily linguistic. I mean, to be human is, is, in large part, to be able to use language. And so we're immersed in, in a language experience all our lives. Most of our waking moments were involved with language. And so it's very definitely a reality. You can't deny it's not real. You can't deny it doesn't have a huge effect on the, on the world we live in. So the same applies to the language that our machines use today. Language includes computer languages. Software utilizing machine language enables machines to perform tasks hardly even imagined 50 years ago. Software, by the meaning it carries, enables the complex electronic circuitry in computer chips to perform astonishing feats. Without the software, the hardware could uh, accomplish nothing useful. So that chip, unless we had something, some, some software giving an instruction, it, it doesn't do anything. Right. Enabled by software, the circuitry of our smartphones, for example, enables us to place calls to a good fraction of the world's inhabitants, can provide detailed navigation instructions in a strange city, can recognize our speech, uh, can search the web, to provide verbal answers to our spoken questions. That's the power of the software in our smartphones. Note that downloading a new app does not alter the mass of one's phone by even a single atom. Language is truly a non-material reality. Yet language can profoundly affect the material realm. So whereas uh, you know, language is not material itself, it can impact and affect the material realm we live in. Robots directed by their software are transforming major aspects of the physical world around us. It manufactures many of the products, if not most of the products we use, including our, our automobiles. Here you, you see robots uh, assembling minivans, in this case, uh, in a plant in Ontario, Canada. John, we have to hold right here. We'll be uh, picking this up again after a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. Scientific materialism, the belief that life is nothing more than the product of blind, undirected processes. Why has our world chosen to push a pseudoscience that is neither fact-based nor provable, but instead is a narrative simply designed to push their own agenda? It is time to embark on an amazing journey as we delve into several facets of science. Paleontology, geology, astronomy, microbiology, genomics, and more. Each one of these areas confirming the work of our Creator. We're inviting you to come along with us in this unique presentation, The Miracle of Creation, for your gift of only $20. From Dr. Danny Faulkner and the wonders of our universe, to Dr. Marcus Ross and the discovery of soft tissue inside dinosaur bones, you will be captivated, entertained, and astounded as the true facts of science ring out, pointing to its author as the creator of all. To get your copy, write to Origins, Cornerstone Network, 1 Signal Hill Drive, Wall, PA, 15148, or call 412-824-3930. Get your DVD today for only $20 and find out how God has made himself known for all who are willing to see.
Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. John Baumgartner, who's been sharing about Darwinism Doesn't Work, Part 2. And John, we've been talking about something really fascinating and crucial to our understanding and existence as human beings, a part of reality that's not composed of matter, reality that we need uh, language. Can you, can you tell us more about this? We saw that language involves the assignment of meaning to a set of symbols, to create a vocabulary, together with a set of rules to allow us to join these symbols or words together to be able to com communicate almost anything. And, and those symbols are both visual in the form of letters and words and audible in the form of sounds. Right. And in Genesis, uh, we have the example of the whole universe coming into being. It says, and God said, 10 times in Genesis 1, and things came into being. So God's idea communicated via the vehicle of language, spoken words, created reality. That's right. So we have a basis. Uh, uh, we could go back, in a sense, behind Darwin and, and, and uh, the Big Bang and say, before there was matter, there was mind. That's right. That's right. And, and I would, we didn't talk about it, but mathematics is language, and therefore, because our laws of physics are mathematical, we, we can infer that there is a linguistic underpinning of matter itself expressed by these laws. So even, even the material world seems to have this linguistic uh, underpinning. Okay, let's deal with this very important issue of how does language arise? Where does language come from? The laws of physics offer no hint, no indication whatever that matter has any inherent language generation capability. Elementary particles, atoms, molecules simply have no ability to assign meaning or recognize meaning. And it's not surprising because uh, language is non-material in its basic essence. You wouldn't expect matter to have this ability. Matter, energy, can't know anything. We can program it to do things, but only, only a mind can know, can have knowledge. That, that's right. But what about, here's an, another possibility. Someone will say, well, what about random processes? Random material processes. Can they possibly generate meaning-bearing linguistic sequences? Well, here's a sequence of 800 random characters. And uh, if, if you can survey that, you can see that it, at least for someone that speaks English, there's no, <laughs> that this is just only gibberish. So that preceding slide displayed a random sequence of 800 characters with the same character frequencies found in typical English text, including a blank. But not surprisingly, the result is gibberish. It's because the defining aspect of language is missing, namely assignment of meaning. Mm. So random processes never generate meaning-bearing strings beyond a trivial string length. Mm. So what is the source of language? For human language and the computer software we create, the answer is clearly a mind or intellect. You have to have a mind to have meaning and then the, to create something to convey that meaning, which is language. Then what about the source of genetic language? For this case also, there seems to be no other rational possibility than a mind or an intellect. Because the genome of even the simplest organism is so vastly more complex in its structure than any software system devised by humans, a mind with capabilities vastly beyond our own is required. So what might the options be? Uh, and the only plausible candidate of which I'm aware is the creator God of the Bible. So to me, the linguistic specifications in, in the DNA of every organism on earth whose explanation requires a mind with capabilities far, far beyond our own is close to irrefutable evidence for God's reality. And in my assessment, very few times in human history 
has objective evidence, objective evidence for God's reality been so abundant and clear as it is today through what has been revealed by molecular biology about the structure and function of life at the molecular level. If we're just going to conclude in an unbiased, objective manner, looking at what we see in the cell, we have to say, here is a mind like no other. Right. Mm -hmm. In Romans 1 talks about th that God has revealed Himself mm -hmm. through what has been made. And, uh, but especially today when we are able to see what God has made in, the, in living things at the molecular level, I, I say there's, we are certainly without excuse. There's no other possibility. It's obvious that humans did not create genetic language. In this case, in my view, there seems to be no other rational possibility than the God of the Bible. This has really been fascinating stuff. Uh, something that we really haven't covered uh, that much on origins. John, thank you for being with us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. And thank you for joining us today as we looked at something that on the one hand is quite complex and yet on the other hand is very simple and that is language. We can't even convey the simplest meaning without expressing ourselves in either oral or written language. And language is something that can't come from matter. It has to come from mind. And when we see the language of DNA, which is so much greater than human language, we have to conclude if we're being objective and rational and honest that there must be a far greater mind than man that has made all things. And isn't that something? Because it just goes to show you once again that what we always like to say on this program, we know what the Bible says is true and the proof is all around you. I want to thank you for joining us for Origins. And I'd also like to remind you that this program takes a lot of time, a lot of people, a lot of uh, machines uh, to, to make happen. And so we have a team here and we would like you to be a part of our team. Won't you prayerfully consider supporting us both by your prayers and by your finances so that we can continue to make programs that show the world how awesome our Creator is and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 2112, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.